Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Back at you. <laughs> Good morning um, for everybody in the room and on the webinar. My name is Diana McEwen, and I direct the Metro Region of CERT's Clean Energy Resource Teams at the Great Plains Institute. Um, and I had a little bit to do with these workshops way back when, when we launched them 100 years ago. Um, welcome to the March 6th version of the Green Set Cities workshop. Happy to have you here. Um, as you probably know, hopefully, if you're on, um, we're going to be talking about shared mobility and electric vehicles today. And um, we want to thank Stephen, uh, who is our sponsor um, for the workshop series this year. We're really excited about that and really helps us bring this to you. So thank you to them. And if you're a tweeter, hashtag GreenStep WKSHP, shortened for workshop. Um, we'll be tweeting and um, sharing information. So help us um, tweet, retweet, follow us online. Uh, we have lots of folks on the webinar um, and um, a handful of folks in the room. Um, and we're just excited to be here. So um, what I usually do, because it's been a while, is I like to hear you know, kind of some of the cities that are in the room. And there's just a handful. Um, and then, um, and I know that there's a lot on the webinar as well. So um, let's see, I'll just call out. We've got Edina in the room. We've got Hastings in the room. We have Falcon Heights in the room. Uh, St. Paul in the room. Um, are you sitting? Okay. Um, and then on the webinar, will you sh share with us, Danielle, who's on the webinar? Uh, I don't, I have a name. Oh, let me see. Oh. I might, I might know. It's okay, hard. all right. It's possible. So it's going to be a Diana quiz for yeah. Wednesday morning. City, we have Andrew. Oh, what city? What city? <laughs> Andrew uh, Egan. Uh, Amanda Bednar from. She's Elk River. Yeah. Hi, Amanda. Uh, ben Lehman. Um, uh, is that Malax? Is he the Green Corps member for Malax? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. There we go. <laughs> what? Ah. They're doing shout outs on the. Hooray. Are they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fun. Oh, Am I getting it right? Yeah, yeah, you got Malax right. I want this tweeted, people. <laughs> Come on, I'll keep going. There I love go. it. All right, now they're recording now. White hair. Ah. All right. Cool, this is awesome. <laughs> Yay, Green <Yeah>. Corps. <laughs> this is awesome. I like interaction. Say names, I want to guess. Okay, oh, okay, more names. Uh, let's see, I don't know if I'm overlapping. Colby Abaz. He is our Northeast coordinator um, for CERT. Awesome. David Wander. He's Faribault City uh, Planner. Okay. Drew Chirpich. Don't know Drew. Hi, Drew. Hi, Drew. Uh, Tina Fulch. Red Wing. Jane McCurry. Red Wing in her, per, in her professional life, uh, Chan Hansen in her personal life. All right. Hey, hey, oh, hey, that's, hey, what hey, oh God, that's what I meant. Oh, that's what I meant. Jill Curran. She uh, it was with the Energy Smart Program and Chamber of Commerce, but I think okay. she's just a super engaged human oh, being right like now. Uh, John Howard. Winona. Uh, Lisa Pollock. That's my colleague. That's my other third lady. Uh, Mary Koch. Ramsey County. Uh, Megan Treeks. Hi, Megan. Uh, Mickey. Morris. Yeah, Morris. Morris. Mike. Really? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, he might have been someone who said in a chat. Uh, okay. Mike is with um, uh, Pine. No, I don't know. Uh, Minette. Yeah. Oh, Mike. Yeah, Mike Claremont. Mike Claremont. Mike Claremont. If, it, if you would have said the last time, I would have known. Okay. Uh, Medi Fiedler. That is a uh, Southwest Search Coordinator. Look at the search people showing up. Sarah Brewer. Oh, she's new with the city. New with the city, welcome. I think. Uh, um, what's the last name? Brewer. I'm sorry if I'm saying. Yeah, that's okay. She's gonna say it. Pop it up. Winona. Yes, Winona Green Court. Yeah. I was like, okay. I know um, her name. And then Tom Esden, uh, Dakota County. Uh, he was uh, he was at uh, the APA um, conference that uh -huh. I did up okay. in Rochester, and Rochester, was really interested in this stuff. And Tracy Shimmick. Shimmick. Oh, I saw that name, but I don't know the city. All right. Well, okay. that was fun. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's always just good to know, kind of have a sense of the cities, and we have a lot more cities. White Bear Lake. Tracy is from White Bear Lake. White Bear Lake, my hometown. Um, awesome. Um, so we, um, I talked about tweeting. We did intros. We thanked Siemens. 
Um, so at this point, um, we're going to switch the agenda around a little bit. Our um, speaker, Will, is coming from another meeting, so he is not here right now. So I will start. Um, so I wasn't prepared for that right this second, so I will do this. Um, and do I have a clicker? You sure do, and you'll just need to skip ahead. Okay. Oh, can you still see me? Um, you should just be able to, it shouldn't need to be super directed at anything in particular. Okay. There you go. That's a really good presentation that I'm not going to give you. Mm -hmm. I'm just going quick so you don't get too much of it. Okay. <laughs> Hi. It's me again. <clears throat> so as I said, my name is Diana McEwen. I direct the Metro Region of CERT's Clean Energy Resource Team. And I also work at the Great Plains Institute. So uh, CERT is a partnership. I'll talk about that maybe a little bit. This, I may not say that right now. CERT is a partnership with a shared mission um, to run a statewide program. And we divide the state into seven regions. And I direct the Metro Region of that program. And my organization, Great Plains Institute, is one of those partners um, that run this program. And um, so it was uh, 14 months ago at this very workshop in January of 2018 that we did a workshop about electric vehicles. And um, it was the highest attended uh, Green Subsidy workshop ever with 75, including in person and the webinar, blew our minds. And it was at that workshop that we threw out this idea that we might have a peer cohort to come together, learn together, and act together on electric vehicles. And, you know, it was, you know, me and a few colleagues that had been kind of toying with this idea, trying to throw it out there, see what happened. And we thought maybe two or four or six cities would say, yeah, let's go down this path with you for a year and see what happens. Uh, a little bit of a time investment. And when we um, threw it out there, like almost all the hands in the room were, were raised, and we eventually ended up with a lot of cities. So this is cities charging ahead. And um, uh, you know, about a year in, I'm going to share some information and things that have been going on with uh, electric vehicles in cities. Um, and it's led, the project is led by Great Plains Institute and CERT, so like both halves of me. <laughs> so um, first, it's just a tiny bit about Great Plains Institute. We're a 20-year-old um, energy, clean energy nonprofit, and we focus on transforming the energy system to benefit the environment and economy. Um, so, economy and environment, I said it backwards. Um, so, we are, we are working really hard to think about how we can um, make our uh, energy system better. So, we, we usually say, better energy, better world. That's our tagline. Um, so, that's our focus. Uh, we really um, do a lot of stakeholder work um, and, and talk about you know, transformative solutions and work together with folks on that. So, third. Clean Energy Research Teams, um, for those who don't know, again, we're a, a partnership with a shared mission. We really are trying to help people in communities do what they want to do and determine their own clean energy future with projects, community scale projects on the ground. So we're there to help them. We don't come with a mandate. We come and say, what do you want to do? How can we help you make it better, easier, um, connect you to the resources from another project or another community that's done it already um, and move forward? So trying to help make that all happen. Uh, so community-based clean energy, um, we're really about empowering communities to do that work. Um, we really want these solutions permeated across the state. We are, I think, the only um, clean energy organization that really has statewide coverage with staff in every single region, including a steering committee in every region with kind of our fingers on the pulse of what's happening on the ground um, there. Um, and, you know, again, meeting folks where they're at and really not just learning, but taking that learning into action. That's really what we're about. Um, so just a mention about Drive Electric Minnesota. Has anybody heard of Drive Electric Minnesota? Awesome. Um, so Drive Electric is the statewide partnership um, of, of folks really moving the conversation forward on um, electric vehicles, and it's been going on for a long time. It started off as a pollution control agency, and Great Plains Institute now does um, kind of coordinate and facilitate that effort. Um, and so I um, just wanted to mention that um, that effort is public-private. There's a bunch of different organizations involved um, and that, that we do coordinate that at the Great Plains Institute. So cities charging ahead. Um, 
so it's a, like I said, it's a cohort of cities that are working together, um, really trying to figure out how to become EV ready or electric vehicle ready communities. And that's what we're focused on. Um, we are fortunate, um, as I said, we thought maybe two or three or five or six cities would join us and we had 28. So it was a little bit more than we had kind of, we had fit up this little tiny piece and we got the whole cookie. Um, and which is super exciting, um, but we then needed some more resources, staff time and, and funding, and Exile Energy did uh, partner with City Turning Ahead to provide support and resources in line with their um, company's uh, long-term clean energy plan for electrifying transportation. Um, we also have had support from Carolyn Foundation, Energy Foundation, and the seed money for this was the Minnesota Department of Commerce. And also, uh, my search funding has helped fund a lot of my time because it's been an exciting and overwhelming um, journey of this past year. So just a little bit of background. Um, so we did a webinar back in uh, the May of 2017, just kind of talking to folks about what was going on, about the state contract, what was, what kinds of electric vehicles and equipment was on there. Um, we really started trying to figure out, we really were trying to figure out how to engage cities and we kept kind of not getting there. We didn't, it, it just wasn't the right moment. And we were talking about some things and we had a session and. Um, fall of um, 2017 that we could see was starting to more and more interest was coming along, down the pike. Um, and then it was that workshop um, last year in January that really did this. Um, so we pitched this idea. We did the official kind of launch in February with about 23 cities. I you know, wasn't going to take any more and then more cities wanted to come in. And how do you say no to Hackensack? You don't. <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, we had our first webinar in Mar early March. Um, and um, we were off to the races. So here was the pitch that we gave to cities. I think it's important to understand the context. You know, this is what we said. You know, this is what we want to do. We want to explore what does it mean to be EV ready, electric vehicle ready communities. We have a bunch of green step cities practices, best practices. Let's look at those and, and you know, focus on uh, looking at how we take those and do some work with that. Um, and perhaps maybe we need to enhance or change or tweak those uh, based on this, this work that we do over the next year. Um, and, you know, perhaps there will be something more stringent, um, you know, as far as what does it mean, you know, to be an EV ready community. Um, we said we would provide technical and um, assistance to these communities from us and from others um, wherever we saw that that needed help. So we were offering, you know, like more in depth help to these cities. Um, and that the effort would continue through the end of 2018 or longer if, if it's useful. Apparently it was useful because here I am still. Um, some of the goals um, that we had for the cities that we really wanted cities to include uh, purchasing electric vehicles for their fleet. Um, so we wanted them to put it in their purchasing plan. You know, it was, we couldn't just say, hey, yeah, buy them right now this year. It's a process, right? Um, and so, you know, that was the goal was to get them into their purchasing <laughs> plan to install some of that infrastructure. And specifically, you know, we want them to have it as their city so they can plug in their vehicles um, for the city. But we really wanted them to have installed electric charging that was available to the public because that's really what transforms that, that market. We want to transform um, what we're doing here. And then um, also we really wanted to provide guidance to private development. Building is happening, and as those buildings are happening and they last for a long time, we want to make sure that they're EV ready, that the conduit is put in, that, you know, at least, and hopefully also that charging infrastructure, um, stations in parking ramps, et cetera, multifamily housing, whatever it might be, parking ramps. Um, so the desired outcomes, you know, having some cities do fleet analysis, um, you know, having the cities, and we, put, we wanted to put numbers to this. Um, cities exploring adding electric vehicles, the installation of charging infrastructure, and both at the level two and DC fast charger, that those fast charger. Some people call them level three, they're not really, they're called DC fast chargers. The level ones are great, but it's essentially an outlet, so there's outlets everywhere. That we're not trying to build outlets. <laughs> that, you know, that, that should be our motto. We're not trying to build outlets. Um, and then um, that we, certs and GPI, would be creating tools, resources, and guides to help um, the cities achieve these outcomes. So, you know, we're offering you all this assistance, but what we want back from you is at, we're going to help create these guides and tools, and we want feedback from you as we go through this process so that at the end of this, what we come out with is a set of, of guides and tools that we can then take from 28 cities to 280 cities or 2,800 cities or whatever the number is, um, that they don't have to go through what we did, although we had fun. I'll just say that. And people who are in the room that know we've had, we're having fun. Um, and so we, um, we you know, really want to put forward um, these tools so 
the next cities can just go, okay, I want to put in a charger. Here are the steps to do that. Okay, I can't decide what to do here or there. You know, here's what I do. Um, so structured webinars, um, we have in-person meetings um, every other month for three hours. And yes, they do come and they engage and it's really exciting. And uh, huge shout out to my Southeast peeps because uh, they have to drive probably the furthest. Some of them drive an hour and a half to a three hour meeting and then drive an hour and a half back. So that's quite a commitment and um, they're super engaged and I just love working with all the, the um, cities across the state. Um, we limit it to just the CCA members. We want them to be able to be really candid about what the challenges and, and uh, 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 barriers are, um, whether it's a city council or a mayor or a utility or whatever. We just want them to be able to say, because if we don't know really what the barriers, we can't move forward. So I've been mama bear, like <laughs> um, uh, keeping those um, private. And um, so people are like, want to peek in the tent, like what's going on in there? And so we're going to give you a little peek in the tent a little bit today, but uh, a little bit more um, at an event that's coming up at the end of the month. Um, a lot of really great conversation with Robin Robin updates. We do presentations, have discussion. Um, and we're really trying to achieve that joint um, action. And part of that has been building relationships in some of these um, cohorts. It's been really exciting to see the relationships that are brewing that, uh, that we're hearing are having uh, impacts outside of the electric vehicle conversation. Just building those relationships the cities are helping with other things, other sustainability issues. So here's the cities, 28 of them. Um, so we've got a couple in the room, um, at least well, two in the room, uh, three in the room, <laughs> and then um, a number, it sounds like, on the phone. Um, so what is happening so far? So a number of cities are participating in fleet studies. Um, I think there are uh, 10 or 11. Um, that are taking, uh, that are doing fleet studies, that are CCA members, <clears throat> cities charging at CCA. Um, a number of them have already installed charging infrastructure or are working on that. Um, a few are considering kind of, uh, kind of the process um, has purchased. Um, and quiz, does anybody know what a BEB is? What's a BEB? Battery electric vehicle. Battery electric vehicle. I call it a full electric vehicle. I have a colleague that doesn't like me to say that. But that's what I think about is the battery electric vehicle is a, a, a electric vehicle that has no gas tank. The no gas tank vehicle, that's what that is. And then PHEV, anyone? Anyone? Plug-in plug hybrid electric vehicle. Yeah. So some cities are doing that. Several are looking at opportunities to guide private development um, to give incentives. Um, or, you know, if you, like the city of St. Paul will talk a little bit, you know, if you get this much money from the city, you need to do this. Um, the city of Edina is doing something, so we'll hear some of those things. Uh, it's very exciting to make sure that we're doing the right thing because, you know, once you build something, it's there for a while. And also, it's really expensive to break up concrete and go back and put in wiring, so let's do it right at the beginning. Um, so here's some of the tools and resources that we're developing, um, uh, you know, frequently asked questions. Uh, this decision tool, which I'm super excited about, which we're hoping to unveil at the end of the month at our event, um, and uh, really helping cities not tell them, here's what you should decide. But there's so many decision points. You know, which charger, like, do I do a level two or a DC fast charger? Once I decide I'm going to do a level two, which kind do I get? Where do I put it? Should I charge with electricity? There's all kinds of decision points. And if you're really new to this and you have no idea, you would like some guidance, and perhaps from some people that have gone through this. And so what we do then is not tell you do this. We say, you could do this, or you could do this. Here's some pros and cons, here's some resources, go forth. You know, so just, you know here's what the city, here's an example. So we're trying to put that together. It's very exciting, or we're, it'll not likely be like a PDF of documents that you look at. It'll be something a little bit more engaging, um, but more to come. I can't reveal everything here. Um, we're working on a community education toolkit because what we heard from cities is that, you know, there's still a lot of people in their community that don't understand what electric vehicles are, the role of them, you know, um, have questions about, you know, uh, the range or where do I charge or how much are they, you know, just some basic education. And it seemed like we could write a service um, to these cities to put together a toolkit that includes um, copy they can put on their uh, website that gives some basic information. Um, links to resources, 
you know, perhaps a newsletter, um, sample newsletter article or a press release to send to the paper so that people get educated, some materials that will help, and then also have the same kind of messaging and communication across the state if they're all using this, this toolkit to educate um, their communities about what is electric, what are electric fields, and also what are they doing as a city, you know, as a city, and here's some of the stuff that they're working on and doing and, and trying to really just get that out there, helping, again, move that, that um, conversation forward. Am I going too slow? I probably am, but I'm getting there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I keep I keep kind of uh, you know uh, foreshadowing this event at the end of the month. Here it is. Um, okay. There's just not enough ways to use the the letters EV and something, and so we had a lot of fun. If you know me, you know I love to name things. I actually had a hand in naming this very um, uh, uh, Green Step Cities um, uh, organization or partnership, but Evolution. Um, so we are doing an event at the end of the month um, called uh, Evolution, Charging Ahead with Electric Vehicles in Minnesota Communities. It will be kind of a culmination of this past year of work with the City's Charging Ahead group. Um, we will, the, the City's Charging Ahead cities will come um, in the morning, just them, from 10 to 11.30 to share really candidly, like, how did it go? What would have been better? Like, what did we learn? What was the best thing you did? Like, kind of all of that stuff that, so we can really capture you know, um, that work and um, what could have been better. And then uh, at 11.30, we've invited other cities, other stakeholders to join us. Uh, please join us for lunch. And a keynote by Mike Salisbury, um, who uh, works for both the city and the county of Denver, um, who has incredible electric vehicle goals. Uh, very exciting. Um, and he's going to be talking about some of the things that they're doing. Um, you know, they want to have 200 EVs by 2020. So how they're getting there, what he's done in the city. And I know it's a bigger city than a lot of the cities here, uh, but it was hard to find a comparable Minnesota-sized city that was doing a lot outside of Minnesota um, to bring in to talk. And so it's a little bit more um, aspirational, let's say. Um, and so we're super excited to have Mike come and talk to us. Uh, and share what he's doing, and for uh, us to engage and perhaps learn a few things about what you know what they the path that they've gone down. We're going to have panels of our cities from Cities Charging Ahead talking about those three topics that they've been working on for this last year: uh, electric vehicles on their fleets, charging infrastructure, and that private development piece. So you'll be able to learn and hear what they've been working on, what they've done, what's worked, what's not worked. Um, so cities that are not participating can hear kind of some of that. Um, we're going to launch and review those resources that I was talking about, including that decision tree. Um, we will also have uh, Rebecca Place from the uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency will talk about the Volkswagen settlement and what's next um, to give people an update on what's happening there. And I know everyone's you know, waiting to hear what's happening there because money, right? Money talks. Um, and then, then, then it's like, okay, now what? What's next? People keep asking me what's next, and I think originally we thought, yeah, we do another cohort, like a second cohort of cities, you know, doing the same thing. And I don't think that that's, I think we've learned what we've learned. And now it's time to scale up and replicate and kind of get this out there. And what is the next conversation? Is it at the county level? Is it with cities and counties together? Is there a utility component? Is there, you know, what is it? I don't know. Um, and so, um, you know, we're really going to have that conversation there about what's next. And so that's why we want all of you cities, other stakeholders, uh, you know, companies to come and have that conversation with us to figure out where we're going. We're really excited about how do we really scale up in Minnesota communities um, for electric vehicles. So re register today. Oh, and I want to say that there's uh, for cities, uh, ones that are non, uh, any cities in Minnesota, um, it's only 20 bucks. We've done a discounted price, so 20 bucks for, and it's, you know, lunch and um, so it's 20 bucks for lunch um, and a great experience. But so um, please join us. We'll, um, there's a, a link right there, um, but we'll set it out with follow up or it's on, it's all over. I think it's on the Green, it's on the Green Step City website, or yeah. no, on the listserv. Yeah. I put something <coughs> the other day. It went out on the bulletin too. went on the bulletin. What is it it's at Como Park um, at the Visitor Center. So it should be easy for you. <laughs> City of St. Paul can get there. Um, yeah, it's going to be at the Visitor Center at the Bullard um, Auditorium in the Visitor Center at the Como Park um, new conserv um, and conservatory there, so Como Park. I was trying to get it at the pavilion where the, they have the solar-powered charging infrastructure, but um, the person was on vacation didn't get back to me in time, so eh, it's okay. Um, but yeah, so we're super excited. Um, hope folks can sign up and join us. I have a goal of 
you know, a certain number of people that I want to be there. So help me, help me, you know, make my goal. That's all I have. Any questions quickly before I turn it over to Will? And online, if anybody has any questions. So can you just say a word about where do you imagine this should go next in terms of helping cities work as a group? I mean, is it more intense work with utilities, mm -hmm. um, private development firms? You know, that's really interesting. Um, based on Person some of, agency. right, uh, I'm sorry? Person agency. Yeah, uh, well, um, so I, I feel like it might be um, engaging uh, leadership in cities a little bit more. So uh, some of the people, you know, the, we don't have the mayors coming to these meetings, and that's okay. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, perhaps the next step is at that higher city administrator, city manager, city council, mayor labor, like really engaging at that more leadership level to get moving because there's a lot of people that are really passionate about this. And I'm not saying, you know, some of them, you know, some of the cities are the whole, you know, council mayors, everyone's on board, some of them not so much. And so I think there's, you know, how do we really engage the decision makers perhaps in cities to, to move this along if we're talking about cities. Um, there's certainly some interesting things with counties. There's yeah. several counties that are planning on coming to the event and they've been engaging and reaching out to me and talking to me a little bit. Um, and, you know, then again, I said, you know, is there, you know, something where we're trying to help a county connect with its cities and, you know, how do they, are they working together on the infrastructure, uh, perhaps, or, you know, cooperative purchasing for vehicles or whatever that might be. And of course, cities and counties have different roles when it comes to ordinances and, you know, all those different things. So. Um, I don't know. It's definitely utilities are very engaged. You know, the, uh, the investor-owned utilities, the big utilities, need to put forward a plan um, this month, uh, I think, or, you know, really soon about how they're going to be doing electric vehicles. Uh, we've been having conversations with some of the municipal um, of the utilities and the cooperatives, and there's a number of them that are engaged and really interested um, in how they move forward. You know, they make money selling electricity, so it turns out a charging station might be a, might be in their best interest, and so they're they're obviously a huge stakeholder. Um, there's you know electric vehicle co companies. Um, you know we are also at CERTS and GPI interested in um, renewable energy uh, kind of charging stations, so stations that are connected some way to solar, um, you know either on site or some other you know we're, so we're really interested in kind of the cleanest. Charging, although we have a pretty clean green grid here in Minnesota, so um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. You know, we'll see. You know, we're going to tee that up and um, see where it goes naturally. I'm not sure exactly. Good question, though. Anything else? Cool. Awesome. Um, so I need to back this all the way up now. Sorry, Will. <laughs> Close your eyes. Don't look. This is just review for you going yeah, backwards. I'll <laughs> review. Remember that? Okay. Thanks, Diana. Well, my apologies on being late. Uh, I'll we, turn it over to Will here. We need an even better transit and transportation and uh, road system in the city. Uh, but thank you for being flexible, and Diana, thank you especially for being flexible. Um, I, I have. Uh, two different subjects which are closely related, but they are two different subjects this morning, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, uh, I will skip my who I am and just assert that you should uh, be interested in these two subjects. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, the first uh, thing that Christopher asked me to talk about is uh, the shared mobility collaboratives in the, in the region, and shared mobility more generally, and uh, uh, it's a subject that I have come to learn quite a bit about uh, after joining the Shared Mobility Collaborative recently, and that's a collection of cities and stakeholders around the region that is interested in uh, understanding and promoting and developing good policies around uh, shared transportation services. So uh, it, it, sometimes it's easier to talk about what shared mobility is not than what it is. It is not me driving in my own personal vehicle. And then going home and parking it in my garage and not letting anybody else use it. After that, it's going to be wide open. It might be my own personal vehicle that I leave at the airport and then somebody else rents it from me while I'm out of town and they drive around. And that is actually a thing that is happening right now. The, the website Turo, T U R O, uh, allows that. And um, I haven't signed up for it yet, but it's sort of intriguing. Um, but it's sharing transportation 
uh, resources uh, with a broader audience than just your own household and family. But, uh, uh, so uh, it, it is, it, and, it, and it includes public transit. That is obviously the, the original shared mobility is a bus uh, or a train that you share with other people. And you don't have to park it in your garage when you're done with it. Somebody else can use it, and, uh, and, and it's a great system. It doesn't take up space downtown when you're not using it, et cetera. Uh, uh, here in the cities, of course, we've become very familiar with Nice Ride. That sort of was sort of the next step in shared mobility. Um, people like to come downtown. Uh, some people put their bikes on the front of the bus, obviously, but other people can't, don't want to, whatever. They get downtown. I love a bike to go to Loring Park for lunch or to bike to my next appointment, et cetera. Shared mobility. Uh, I talked, mentioned a bit briefly about car sharing, et cetera. So there are all kinds of different versions of this. And as I said, as technology changes and as people have new ideas, why shouldn't someone use my, my car when I'm you know, out of town, right? Uh, we're going to see more kinds of shared mobility. But it raises all kinds of interesting issues. Um, if you are Metro Transit, the original shared mobility provider in the cities, uh, how do you uh, help, how do you integrate with car sharing? And they've, they've done a great job, actually. Uh, our car members uh, can use their little uh, uh, radio frequency card that they use to unlock our cars, also to pay for transit. Fantastic integration. Uh, but that took policy and, and implementation work on the part of both institutions, right? Um, more publicly, uh, Lyft and Uber, obviously, people familiar with, even if you're not using it yourself. Uh, do we establish a set curb space where it looks like a, like a taxi stand? Well, we're not taxis, right? So all kinds of interesting municipal, private policy questions uh, uh, come up. And uh, the more ideas that people have, the more policy challenges there are. And because a lot of this stuff is being driven privately, uh, it's sometimes a challenge for public institutions to keep up. Uh, who knew that we would have to be thinking about, do you reserve curb space for an electric vehicle charging spot, right? That is a interesting intersection of a lot of different uh, uh, authorities. So um, there are a lot of reasons why cities uh, and jurisdictions want to promote shared mobility. Uh, I mentioned the first one, which is that um, it provides a lot of options for people. Uh, a second might be you don't have to, you can put space to better use if, if someone is, uh, is able to use a different choice than their own personal car that they always have to park someplace. You don't have to have as much parking, you can put that, that uh, space to better use. Uh, the third is that it saves your citizens money. Uh, I don't have to own as many cars in my household because I have other choices and I can spend that money more, more locally than other places. Um, so there are a lot of different reasons why institutions want to promote this and why they then have to tangle with these difficult questions. What, how should I allocate my, my uh, scarce curb space, et cetera. Um, same questions on the business side. So if I'm a business and I have been providing free parking, now do I put some, and I know businesses have been doing this for years now, uh, do I give a, a preferential parking for uh, uh, carpools, for EVs? for bikes, for, you know, and, and you start dividing things up. Those are interesting questions, but people want those choices. And we're finding that employers that don't offer them <coughs> as a disadvantage, so now they kind of have to run to keep up. Um, and uh, uh, they're asking the same questions. If I give um, uh, a transit pass, which a lot of institutions do, do I also give a car share or a bike share? Like, what, which shared mobility thing do I pick to, to give to my uh, employees. And these are the questions just keep coming, right? Um, uh, but they are incentivized to do this. Uh, two years ago, Smart Growth America, uh, SGA, and, um, an advocacy group, but teamed up with a very disinterested uh, property management group to survey businesses that had recently changed their headquarters. Uh, and so, sort of a natural experiment where did you move from and where did you move to? So it wasn't, we think of what you should do, we just, what did you do, and then, and where, where did you move from, uh, and to. And fascinatingly, uh, uh, the before and after were all businesses are moving from unwalkable places to walkable places, from untransitable places to transit accessible, and then bikeable to bikeable. Uh, and uh, uh, because employees are voting with their feet, employers are following and voting with their feet. Uh, 
so they're, they're working, and, and where are they moving to? They're moving to places that are, let's just call it, uh, crowded, right? With less curb space, with less parking space, with more transit options, but just pushing these questions to the fore, how are we as businesses and, institute and, and governments gonna allocate the scarce space that we all wanna be in because we wanna be close to each other? Um, it's gonna require education. So as the businesses decide what kind of benefits they're gonna offer, then you also have to educate the, the, the employees and um, that's a whole other thing. So uh, mostly I'm here with you today to, to not to offer you answers, but just to raise a bunch of questions that people are struggling with and then to describe uh, how the shared mobility collaborative in the cities exists to help answer those questions and to invite your participation. So uh, I see that we're here today with McKnight Funding in part, and uh, they do a lot of great work in this area. They funded uh, an organization in Chicago called the Shared Use Mobility Center. Sometimes gets confused with what we're doing here, but the SUMC, Shared Use Mobility Center, to study where the cities were in all of this and then make some recommendations for how we could let me just say, catch up to what some other folks were already doing. Um, so they answered these questions. The report is online, and if you can't find it, give me a ring, and I'll help you find it, or I'll send you an actual talk from people here. Oh, people are waving it. People are waving it. Awesome. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, so on the basis of that report, uh, that report made a number of recommendations, but it's not self-implementing. Familiar with, right? You have a great report in LA. We formed an organization called the Shared Mobility Collaborative in the cities uh, to help move the recommendations of that report forward. And completely voluntary. If you want to join, welcome to join. Um, and uh, it's it's an information sharing organization. Uh, we don't have any particular power, which may or may not make it uh, sound attractive to you. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, we believe that there is some power, at least in information sharing and getting together to share ideas and challenges. So uh, that's what we do. Let me stop there as a very quick trip to the Shared Mobility Collaborative and Shared Mobility questions, comments. Yes? Yeah. Well, so would you consider, or maybe you're, uh, you've already started to this or thinking about it, working like cities charging ahead to sort of working with a group of of cities who are intent on learning and then taking action that is expanding shared mobility options for in their city. Absolutely. I mean, and, and that's part of what it is. So the city of St. Paul belongs, the city of Minneapolis belongs, um, and uh, uh, part of why I do little talks like this too is to invite others to be long. Um, so we're starting with Minneapolis and St. Paul mostly, not because we invited them because they're special, but because they have the capacity to join. And that's always a challenge, right? So the smaller cities maybe don't have quite staff capacity, so that's always a challenge. But um, we can offer to them what, what we have come up with as well. Yes? Just from a trending perspective, I'm curious to hear what your opinion is on like how quickly the shared mobility is going to become the kind of our daily use of life, right? Where nobody really owns a car anymore either. Yeah. A shared car or a shared EV or, you know, an Uber type system. Right. What are your thoughts on how quickly? That's a great question. Well, I don't remember who said this. Um, the future is already here. It's just not equally distributed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's really, that. this is a case of that where some people are already there. Um, uh, I've actually gone a little bit backwards. I, I used to live on a very frequent transit line in Minneapolis, and um, my wife and I shared a very, very small car with two children, and we both worked full time, and we just used shared mobility stuff to get around, and that's just how it was. Um, uh, we now, we didn't, not to make it about me, but we have actually moved backwards, so we're not on that line, and so we've kind of moved backwards, unfortunately, so we're going into the past. Uh, <laughs> but um, there are always early adopters, and, and there are people for whom this works well right now. Uh, and uh, the place I was just coming from, um, downtown Minneapolis, the Nick on 5th, right? It used to be people would talk about transit as sort of thing in last resort, right? Only people who, who couldn't buy the car, or, you know, would, would choose to take. Now the, the, it's a little bit flipping, right? The wealthy people are, well, I'm going to use the transit, and I'm not going to have a car, and I'm going to 
Uber and Lyft and scooter around and right. I mean, you look at who's on scooters. It's mostly people that look like me, for better or for worse, right? So, um, uh, but the money in the market is is moving quickly to we're going to be on trade. Uh, there is a uh, a map which I don't have a, a paper copy of with me, but I could talk to Christopher about follow up. Where has development occurred in the last 10 years in the cities? A stop, it's 30 percent of multifamily residential development has occurred on 2 percent of the land in the region, which is stationary. All of the multifamily residential is going to stationary. And not just along the line, so you can see the track, but you can't get at the stationary. Um, and that's the lifestyle that a lot of new people want. And I, I hate calling it lifestyle because it sounds like a, a, a thing that, you know, you, but that is the direction that I think people are headed. Now, other people cannot imagine doing that yet, right? And so there's going to be an adoption process. And I think that the, why I'm excited about shared mobility is because in order to offer those options to more people in more situations, we're going to need different kinds of options. And, but I think it will, I think it will, I think we'll see rapid penetration of a lot of different kinds of things and less rapid than people might think for other things. For example, I am not a, uh, I don't think we're going to see autonomous vehicles running around in the numbers that people, that some people think we will anytime soon. I, I just, I was just in a, another conference, not the one this morning, but I heard a guy from uh, Florida State talking about their new automated shuttle in Gainesville. They have never seen a snowflake. Ever in games, right? But the shuttle can't run when, when it's raining too hard, and it rains a lot in Gainesville, as it turns out. And so, um, if you can't use them when it's raining, you can't use them when it's snowing, and you can't use, you know, pretty soon they're not really practical. Uh, and so, uh, I, I don't, I don't think that is. You know, we should think about it, but I, I'm not holding. So, so I was a user of Cargo, mm -hmm. uh, small smart car, mm -hmm. existed here, and it, yeah. it, it, it fit in with my sort of busing and biking. And yeah, stuff. right. Um, I presume it was a, just a financial, a raw financial decision. Yeah. Uh, is the thinking that there, a Cargo or a similar um, or a share of smart car will be will sort of be able to make it and come back to the Minneapolis big ball? Yes. What a, I did not pay him to ask that question. <laughs> um, but uh, that's my next conversation. Oh, okay. So, okay. Fantastic. Um, it was financial. Uh, uh, now, I, I, not that I disbelieve or, or automatically believe corporate statements one way or the other necessarily, so you can believe this or not. Cardigo said it was fundamentally an issue of the 20% rental fee on individual Cardigo trips that made it not financially viable for them. So we were treating them as a rental car. Uh, and the rental car fee is meant in part to uh, capture uh, visitor to charge outsiders, not just to soak them necessarily, although maybe that too, but because they're not, if you don't live here, you're not paying property taxes. Property taxes pay for the vast majority of local roads, right? Not the gas tax, that goes to highways. Um, and, but we're charging car to go users, which almost by definition live in town and are already paying those property taxes. It, it, it didn't work out and it didn't make policy sense, but we're trying to fix that. There's a bill in the legislature this year to try and fix that, and if you feel strongly about that, I encourage you to let your legislator know. So, uh, perfect segue. So, our, uh, the Shared Use Mobility Collaborative does the study, what are the gaps in your shared mobility processes? car to go left a big hole. You should try and fill the car to go hole because one-way car sharing that is, you drive it and then you leave it where you go and you don't have to bring it back, uh, is a fundamental part of a healthy shared mobility system. Um, our car, uh, which was started in started here and, and continues to, to exist here, is a nonprofit membership organization that does round trip car share. So you have to bring it back to the hub where you rented it. That used to be part of our mix, and we don't live near there anymore, so can't do that anymore either. Um, our car and the city of St. Paul and the city of Minneapolis and XL got together to propose to the Met Council. The Met Council gets a bunch of different federal transportation funds, they put them in a pool, and then they uh, invite proposals for how to spend that transportation money and divvy it up on the basis of different um, uh, evaluation criteria. 
we applied to start a uh, EV car share network that would be like uh, Car2Go and that it would be one way. It would also be electric and it would be bigger. Uh, and it would serve, um, it, in a way that Car2Go tried to fail, it would serve particularly under certain neighborhoods. Um, uh, the proposal was that the Met Council would, would fund half of it and Xcel Energy would fund the other half by, by uh, building all of the charging infrastructure. Good news? Uh, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So uh, the vision of this is that everyone needs to get around, but not everyone needs to or can or should get around with the car. Uh, and if you're sitting in traffic these days and watching people steer with their knees while they text, that's the should not own a car part of that. Um, uh, I mentioned the uh, the need. I, I would emphasize the uh, particularly the, the lack of car share in, in low income neighborhoods, precisely the people that can least afford a car, but most need the mobility. Uh, those folks need access to, to good car share. When I show up late to work because I'm a white guy, it's okay. When other people show up late to work to hourly jobs, to, it's not okay. They lose their job because they let, they don't have access to reliable transportation. Um, so we proposed this, and we proposed doing a bunch of, of uh, hubs that would, in the ideal world, uh, be no more than a five-minute walk away from most places in the, in the central uh, part of the city. Uh, illustrative map, illustrative. <laughs> Do not go to this corner next year and look for a car. It might be someplace else. Uh, but this was what we what we submitted to the Met Council, and uh, to illustrate how we thought we could provide this coverage with uh, with 70 hubs. Okay and uh, half in Minneapolis and half in St. Paul for uh, both because that was the actual need and, and it, as it turns out, it sounds fair and it is fair. Um, those hubs would serve, uh, you could walk to them and you know, if, uh, if you worked the third shift and you needed to go to HCNC and you live here and uh, your bus stops running or stops running regularly at, at 10 p.m. and you can drive, et cetera, um, and so serves in region uh, purposes. Uh, it also connects to all of these bus routes. And so if you come downtown to work uh, and you need uh, to do something during the day, whether it's professional or personal, you don't need to drive your own car downtown. You now have access to the car. And uh, locate the actual locations. Of, these are the illustrative locations that serve all these routes, and we will, of course, be doing our, our best to locate those uh, when we actually do so. so this is how it would work. Um, 70 hubs, uh, most of them with um, level two chargers and some of them with level three. So, uh, and these would all be public facing, not reserved only for our own uh, uh, cars. Uh, serving uh, the metro stops in particular, but also neighborhoods as well. Uh, I mentioned this. And along with the quantifiable benefits, I can um, uh, run a paper that we did uh, out to anybody that is interested. Uh, but we developed all these to, uh, as part of our application to the Met Council, saying that we meet the criteria uh, for the divvying up this, of this federal money, and we, we compete fairly against other uses of transportation funds, and in fact, beat them uh, on these bases. Um, I will anticipate one question. I won't read the whole slide. You, you can do that on yourself, but I will anticipate one question. Doesn't this actually cut into transit use and is therefore actually potentially counterproductive from some perspectives? Um, the access to a car means that uh, nine households will not buy a car. So depending on the, the studies that, that, uh, that we're not the first people in the country, so you look at regions across the country, between 9 and 11, high end is 13, I think that's probably optimistic, but anyway, roughly 10 cars, 9, 10 cars. Um, uh, interestingly enough, since I, I've been talking about demographics here a little bit, um, the, the people that are poorest served by transit, not surprisingly, they reduce their transit use. They replace poor transit with good car share, and that's better for everybody. Um, so it's not that no one will ever get off the bus and take this, that would be absurd. Uh, but on the whole, it helps people feel comfortable with not owning a car. As soon as you own a car, then your transit use increases substantially. So 
but you still have access to the parking lot if you need it. Uh, so, uh, I gave this away at the beginning. The, um, the city was awarded $4 million by the Met Council. Uh, Excel is going to match that with $4 million. We're doing a little more fundraising from the individual cities and counties. Um, if your city or county would like to join, <laughs> uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, and uh, we'll certainly get this underway and we hope to have it on the street in 2020, but uh, also looking to scale it uh, at that point as well. And so um, uh, we're interested in doing that. So um, the, uh, the uh, cars will be jointly managed by Minneapolis and St. Paul probably through our through a contract with our card. We literally were just awarded the money, so this is all being worked out and I'm sharing it with you in real time. Um, but uh, but that's that's the idea at this point. I think oh uh, I talked about the locating in equity. Oh let me let me end with why is Excel doing this. So Excel's been a big supporter of uh, electric vehicles for a while. And uh, their interest is twofold. Diana talked about they want to sell electricity. The second is that they have made commitments to the state to, uh, to use a certain amount of renewable energy. A little tech, but you look like you, people who might be interested in this. I just learned this and I thought it was fascinating. Um, they want, of course, to provide that energy as cheaply as possible. What is the, that renewable energy is cheap. What is the cheapest energy these days? Anyone? It's wind. When does the wind blow most reliably? At night. At, at night. Or... <laughs> at night. And so they need a place of things which will charge at night. EVs. So it uh, makes a lot of sense. So, um, uh, and I will finish with, this is sometimes a, a, a chicken and egg uh, issue. Obviously people aren't going to use EVs until there's a network of the charging stations and they're not going to a lot of money on charging stations until there's a customer base. So this is an attempt for us not only to provide uh, a network of cars, but also to kickstart more general public adoption of EVs by providing a network of charging stations. And um, uh, I, I have an all-electric vehicle myself, uh, and I can say <laughs> the uh, I I love it. I think it's fantastic. But uh, going from uh, hub to hub is kind of a thing. Uh, particularly in, on cold days, and I was giving a friend a drive, and he said, this is just like having a cell phone. You're always like, where's the next charger? Where's the next? <laughs> I'm like, I had never made that analysis. But, uh, <laughs> so um, thank you for uh, listening to two two different presentations at the time and questions on this one. Yeah, so in this um, partnership here, does the city of St. Paul then own the charging stations, or does it still energy? Of course, yes. Great question, um, being worked out as we speak. Yep. Uh, with Metro Transit doing now the electric buses, are they going to be putting infrastructure in at more of their park and rides where they're already going to be putting electric chargers in? Are they going to kind of just say, hey, we're already there, we're going to be putting this in? We're talking with them about that. Great okay. question. So I, I don't mean to be... These are all great questions which are being engaged in right now, and yeah. so I don't have good answers. I've gotten, I've gotten this, my, so my fiance works for Metro Transit, uh -huh. and now he's on the electric bus project. He just got back from Alabama where he got to see all the infrastructure, the charging stations that they're going to be putting in. Uh -huh. So it's really cool. Yeah. Um, so my, I asked him, I'm like, are they going to be doing this? And he's like, I have no clue. So. I just thought it would be a good tie-in. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. No, it makes sense. And it, I would hold this up as yet another example of where we cross-institutional work is necessary, and that's often as challenging as the actual physical work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Question about the funding. You received $4 million from Met Council, $4 million from Excel. Is that enough, or are you going to be good going question. back to Met Council or other sources? The, yeah, good question. The original uh, proposal to Met Council is for $6.7 million. So to do the rollout as originally intended, we need another $2.7 million. Now we could scale the map back a little bit. It's scalable. Uh, so we're going to do it either way. Uh, at, at, we are, however, asking the cities and counties that we will be serving if they would like to pitch in because it will be serving them as well. And they are thinking. Yeah, and I believe we see this as in St. Paul, we believe that this is uh, the first phase. Ultimately, we would 
like to have uh, every resident in St. Paul be within 10 minutes of a multimodal uh, hub. Uh, a question from the interwebs. On top of that question, or the previous question, sorry if this was said already, who owns the hour car vehicle? Uh, the current idea, not yet inked, is that the city or the Minneapolis St. Paul Joint Powers Board will own the cars. Okay. I remember when the St. Paul City Council was sort of uh, chartering car to go, there was a requirement that car to go report on the, I think the concern was the percentage of our cars that were being, or, or car to goes that were being used simply for driving into downtown, leaving the car and going to work. So, yeah, I, so I think the, the word was that car to go would simply replace uh, buses. Did that study ever get presented to the, an analysis to the um, St. Paul City Council? Did we find out? Good question. Yeah. I, I don't know. That's a good question. I should look into that. Well, thank you very, very much for having me. I hope that was uh, super. Well, I'll, I'll be joining you for the rest of the day, if that's okay. So thank you. All day. All right. All day. All right. Woo! Thank you. That was super informative and interesting. And uh, I like how the shared mobility and the electric vehicles came together right there. Win. Yeah. Um, all the wins. So, yeah. Yeah, of course. So then, with the city of St. Paul, then, are they also putting in the electric bill to pay for the So here's a can they hear us? The question. So the question is, is the city of St. Paul paying the electric bill right. for the charging? Or is Excel? Or is Excel? Some type of rebate or program to say, hey, I understand you're going to be having a lot more demand and a lot so like is are, are the chargers going to be free or are they going to charge people or yeah or, who or is somebody going to pay for and if it's free who's paying for it okay. the, the network will pay for itself okay. and so uh if you're a member of the network then you'll bill that way and if you're not a member of the network you'll charge just like it is at the church. so if you're a member of the network a member of the city and a member, oh, if you're using the car, yeah, if you're exactly. a member, then you'll, yeah. you'll pay the electricity that exactly. way. And if you, because I'm just waving to my friend Craig Johnson over there from the League of Minnesota City, he's walking out the door. <laughs> you can't not wave when somebody waves at you, sure. even if you're standing in front of a group of people running a workshop. You know, I'm not rude like that. Um, and so, um, so they would pay, and but then also they're available to the public, and yeah. public can charge there, but they would be charged. Yeah. And is there you maybe don't know the rates and how this is going to work, if it's just kind of a straight up electricity rate or if there'll be some kind of m amount of money that goes back into a fund that helps perhaps perpetuate this, you know, whatever, you know, I, like I'm curious because I, I've heard people talk about, so there's the electricity and then there's like some kind of a surcharge that helps go back into, you know, making sure we have more, you know, infrastructure. I mean, we have a big need here. Is there a talk about, and maybe it's too early, I don't know. We're certainly developing the, the charging rates right now. Um, I, speaking purely for myself, have not thought about charging people more to as an investment fund for further. Um, I wouldn't want to disincentivize. Of course. Them. Well, and I, I think, you know, and I'm a former EV owner. Um, mm -hmm. I was an earlier adopter. It's been two years since I gave up my um, mm -hmm. all electric vehicle that I had for three and a half years. Um, so, but, you know, I already had it, and if I needed a charge, you know, you might there's like maybe just a dollar to hook up, right. and then that goes into infrastructure. There, you know, the and that's a nominal amount. Um, but I'm curious when I've you know been at the Capitol, and there's been lots of questions about kind of how do we we need infrastructure? How do we do that? How do we keep this going? Moving? Yep. Uh, so, well, the, the 10.7 million you have on the front there, that's going to go to buying the vehicles and installing the chargers. Is that how that is that where that 10.7 is going? So uh, the current divvying up is as you, these lines are too thin, it's too subtle, but uh, the, the St. Paul will be buying the vehicles for sure. XL will be building all the infrastructure for sure. 
The charging stations right now are on the St. Paul side of the of the line. Um, it may be that we'll move things back and forth a little bit, but the, for sure the cars are the city's and the joint operating board, and for sure the, the big power cables are XL. The actual charging stations themselves, I think will probably be current ideas of the city, but we'll see. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 I have some comments and questions Please. from uh, the webinar. Uh, first of all, repeating the question is super helpful, so yeah. thank you. Um, question for if lower income people need more access to mobility hubs, why does the map not reflect that? Or does it? So I will uh, go back to the map. So this map does not show ACP 50 areas, that's shorthand for areas of concentrated poverty, more than 50% people of color. Um, but uh, this is APC 50 up here. Uh, this is all ACP 50 over here. And we really tried to, to, to make sure that we were serving, that's not all the ACP 50 areas in the, in the city uh, by any stretch, but we really made sure that we stretched uh, to capture, uh, uh, and I don't remember what the percentage is, but a substantial chunk of those. Uh, it's both a, a substantial chunk of the ACP 50 areas, and the ACP 50 areas are a substantial chunk of, this, of the proposed and served region. Um, so, which is not to say uh, that we have, uh, on, the, on the first round, taken care of the problem by any stretch, but, uh, and it's a great question from the, from the questioner, um, but I think the map does, in fact, represent an effort to serve those areas in a way that, for example, car to go was not serving when it left, um, and we want to make sure that it does. Is there another? Yeah. Um, before, when you said that the city, it might be the city that owns um, the cars or the applicant, like the joint, you meant the city of St. Paul? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so my employer, the PCA, has been developing this uh, Volkswagen settlement money, mm -hmm. and I sort of look over the corner and sort of look at upcoming RFPs. I've not heard, I've not seen in any of the proposed RFPs any sort of preference for funding this project or maybe for St. Paul work. But maybe that, have you been in discussion with the Volkswagen settlement people? Uh, I have not. I believe that the the cities uh, have. And I don't know where that conversation is. It's a great question. So the question in case folks on the webinar do not hear is the question about whether there's been a conversation about um, this project and um, funding from the Volkswagen settlement, which is generally an RFP that goes out and people apply for it. But you know, I don't know if they're going to make some you know kind of special um, put you know RFP for something like this. Well, that's what I yeah. I just and haven't heard. I've seen yeah the future ones that are going to be rolled out. Right. And I just haven't heard about this one. No, it's a fantastic question. Okay. And then the other question was about the city is going to own the vehicles, which city and uh, the city of St. Paul. So make sure that we secure that. Other questions, and I want to move on. I want to make sure we get all our speakers in. This is awesome. And we will have some time at the end for more question and answer. And I don't like to cut it off because people are thinking about things. This is a great conversation. But I want to make sure we get all of our speakers in. Thank you so much, Will. Sure. I'll take that back. Thank you. All right. So now my friend Kurt Schultz from the uh, city of St. Paul will um, talk about, do I scroll now? I guess. <laughs> now I'm going to scroll through all mine. Remember my presentation? Like, <laughs> me, 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 me. Okay. You have to see something three times before. Yeah, right? Exactly. Desired outcomes, okay. Um, cities. Oh, yeah, remember that event? Sign up for that today. 20 bucks for cities. Oh, Mark. At Como yeah. Park. So you can get to it if you live in St. Paul really easily. All right, thanks, Kurt Schultz from the city of St. Paul. My guess is this arrow advances the slides. Uh, so my name is Kurt Schultz. I do work for the city of St. Paul, the Department of Planning and Economic Development. And in the spirit of full transparency, I should tell you, uh, this is not my area of expertise. <laughs> I, I manage the sustainable building policy for the city. I work in the built environment. Uh, the reason that someone else isn't here from St. Paul is uh, those who understand this best and are working on shared mobility in St. Paul are at a shared mobility conference in Chicago right now. So, so you got me. Uh, my goal is to uh, try to not mislead you or provide uh, misinformation. Um, 
I, this, this slide deck is a template that we use at the City of St. Paul. People use it over and over and insert their own slides. This is the standard opening picture. And I like it for this purpose, because it, 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 uh, for this event today, because it demonstrates that for about 150 years, St. Paul has been dedicated to shared mobility in the, in the form of river boats initially, continue to today. Oh, out of the way. You, so, you can uh, do my project. That's right. <laughs> um, so our car um, is after the river boats and after transit and buses and all of that. Uh, our car is probably the first manifestation of shared mobility, uh, modern shared mobility in St. Paul. Uh, our car is a St. Paul-based organization. It was created initially out of the Neighborhood Energy Consortium, which then became Neighborhood Energy Connection, better known as NEC, which recently merged with CEE in Minneapolis. Uh, but it's a, unlike some of these other uh, shared mobility options, uh, our car is a uh, uh, home homegrown uh, organization uh, founded in 2005. Uh, as Will was saying, it's a uh, at least initially was a hub-based system. You pick up the vehicle, you drive it someplace, and then you return it to that same uh, place. Um, it serves St. Paul, Minneapolis. I believe it's the sole provider of shared or shared uh, vehicles at the University of Minnesota. Uh, currently about 60 cars, 50 hubs. Um, and uh, it's about $8.50 $8 an hour to use. And in that, uh, you have the cost of the mileage, the gas, the insurance, all those things that a, you as an individual uh, would need to buy at a higher cost if you if you owned your own, own car. Um, the goal is to have our car move to a fleet of entirely uh, all, all EVs, all electric vehicles. Right now that's not the case and the goal is by 2020. And as Will was saying, our car is the likely partner in this shared mobility uh, proposal in St. Paul and Minneapolis. Um, I should also mention that both St. Paul and Minneapolis have received uh, grants from the Bloomberg Philanthropies. We're two of the 25 cities that received these, uh, these grants nationwide. And uh, the idea in both St. Paul and Minneapolis is to uh, direct the staff person, it's called the climate advisor, that will be made available through this grant to be working on that shared mobility uh, project, at least in part. Right. Okay. No battery, not sure. Just give it a sec. Try now. Perfect. Thank you. So we went from the homegrown our car to the international car to go. Uh, it was really exciting to have car to go in, in the Twin Cities because, as Will was saying, you didn't need to bring the car back to the same place you picked it up. Uh, you picked it up where you found it. You had an app on your phone, or you could identify it on the computer. Uh, reserve the reserve the car that you wanted. Get up to the car. Use a fob to unlock the car and take it wherever you wanted within the geographic area uh, of, the, of the network. Uh, so it was dockless or hubless. You, you, you paid for it by the minute. Um, it only lasted in St. Paul from July 2014 through December 2016. As Will was saying, some of the, and uh, we were talking about some of the, the reasons for that. It was the fact that um, the insurance, excuse me, uh, the uh, the rates charged on uh, rental vehicles in Saint, excuse me, in Minnesota were so high. The highest in the nation is what I what I understand, and so hopefully we can have that addressed by the legislature. Um, also in Minnesota, uh, excuse me, also in Saint Paul, uh, they paid sixty eight thousand dollars in fees, uh, kind of in lieu of what people would pay to feed the meters. That was on uh, car to go to pay, and I I actually feel 
a little personally responsible because I was one of those people who used the car a lot. One way, instead of coming into town, it was back to my house. And I, uh, I at one point had three car to goes parked in front of your house. You know, so there were, there were, uh, then you have to hire staff, right, to get those cars back into the, you know, the, the other neighborhoods. And so, forth. so I, I own, I own part of it anyhow. Uh, moving from cars to bikes, uh, we heard a little bit about Nice Ride again, a St. Paul, Minneapolis nonprofit. Uh, initially, this program was a, the docked system where you would pick up a bike at one of the docks that had 15 or 20 bikes and you needed to leave it at another dock. You didn't need to bring it back to that one. Um, but there's some, some restrictions to that docked system. You can see the number of uh, bikes that existed in the Twin Cities. And they had a couple of different approaches. You could be a, a long-term member for a month or a year and uh, have that sort of structure. Or you could be from out of town or just wanted to use it for an afternoon or a couple of hours. You could do that as, as, as well. So in, in St. Paul in 2018, and this is where St. Paul and Minneapolis diverge, uh, in St. Paul uh, in 2018, we put out an RFP for uh, shared bike uh, providers. Um, we ended up entering into a two-year contract with Lime. Um, and then Nice Ride uh, left St. Paul by the end of last year. Excuse me. And we are likely to be revisiting this uh, in the near future. Uh, the whole nice, excuse me, the whole uh, shared bike system. So a little bit about Lime, not, not uh, homemade, not homegrown, uh, international company out of uh, California. It, one of the great advantages, it is dockless. And I understand that, um, Nice Ride is also going to a dockless system in Minneapolis, but someone else would have to, to speak to that. Um, so we're entered into a two-year contract with them. Uh, currently we have, uh, not currently because there's snow on the ground, but, ground, but when the snow melts uh, in July, um, <laughs> we'll have bikes back on the street. Don't even do that. <laughs> I, I'm not oh, kidding. Dude. I feel like this year that would happen. <laughs> the bikes will be back and they will uh, start adding e-bikes as well. Right now they're just the pedal bikes and they'll start adding electric assist bikes which will help especially on some of the hills we have in uh, St. Paul. You can see the <clears throat> fee structure, a dollar, a uh, dollar for a half an hour. And they also have, Lime has an access for all program. So uh, if you don't have uh, a phone, uh, a cell phone or an app, um, you can access it different ways. They'll, uh, they're figuring that out. As well as if you um, qualify because of your income, uh, they'll set up a program that assists you for that, assists you with that. So that's Lime. And then we have uh, e-scooters. And um, I'd never seen this, the foot scooters term, but I found it on the city's website. That's what we, what we call them there. Um, so Lime and Bird both operate in St. Paul. Uh, back in July of last year, it was a little bit like the Alfred Hitchcock movie, The Birds, because all of a sudden you came downtown and there were bird scooters every place. Um, unannounced, um, no invitation was given to them. Uh, they just showed up um, and uh, they started operating. And so St. Paul said, uh, get them off the streets, get them off the sidewalks, and let's talk. Uh, the, the nice thing is it, it, it forced St. Paul to the table really quickly, and uh, we started figuring out what the rules, what the parameters were uh, for uh, shared shared scooters. And we figured that out. It's a dockless system. Uh, and so in 2018, we had a four-month pilot project. In 2019, uh, we uh, were currently working on this, but we expect to be working with multiple providers of these uh, shared scooters. I will say, uh, just working downtown, I see a lot more people on the scooters than I do on, on the shared bikes. <clears throat> um, 
there's an issue, the things that we need to worry about is the city, uh, the geographic issue, the equity. We want to be ensure, as Will was saying, that people throughout the city, regardless of income or neighborhood, that you have access to the, the shared mobility options, bikes and, and cars and scooters. Um, we want to ensure proper use. People are more often than not riding these on the sidewalk and not on the streets. The motorized vehicle, you're, you're required to follow those requirements. So that's some work we need to do this year. Uh, what are the rates that are charged? Uh, what role does the city have in determining that? Um, and then how uh, are the city's costs recuperated? What, is, what does that look like? So then, uh, just a couple of minutes uh, on EV charging. Uh, St. Paul has uh, a couple of dozen uh, chargers scattered throughout the city, uh, owned by the city. There's more than that in the city, but those are the ones owned by the city. Uh, we used some of our federal recovery dollars under the Obama administration to purchase and install these. Uh, so there's a pretty good network through, throughout the city. We're adding to that because of a, a grant from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency uh, under the Volkswagen settlement. We're receiving an additional four chargers with eight plugs that will be uh, put in this year. Um, we have a sustainable building policy in the city of St. Paul. It's a model policy that other municipalities can replicate either in its entirety or portions of it. One new addition to the policy uh, in 2018 is that if you're constructing new uh, and you're receiving city dollars as part of the project, you need to make the, uh, the building, the structure EV ready. And as we heard before from Diana, that means you need to run the conduit, you need to have room in the electrical panel to, um, uh, to, put, the, to put the box and so forth. It's super low cost. It's just preventing the, uh, the high cost that you would incur if you decided to install the panels later and didn't have the conduit or didn't have the room in the electrical room. So I was right, breaking out concrete, concrete costs money, huh? It does cost money. Yeah, and you're, this is your expertise, building. Building. All right. I, I know that like breaking up concrete. <laughs> yeah. 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 Cha-ching, win. Um, uh, I think this is the last slide, yeah. So we're working right now also with regard to electric vehicles. We're working on a proposed ordinance. And if there's other cities who are doing this, I'd, I'd like to hear about it. We can learn from you. But the idea is that the city has made a significant investment in uh, buying and installing electric vehicle chargers throughout the city. Nothing's more aggravating to an EV owner is to pull up and find a non-EV in that space. Usually there's not a meter there. So it looks like free parking. So um, what we're making it, or excuse me, we're making it a ticketable offense should the ordinance pass, uh, a ticketable offense to park a non-EV into a, a charging uh, a charging space. So kudos to you. Yeah. And I think there's others. You know, this has come up in the city's charging ahead. Um, more in kind of private ramps and things, you know, you're not supposed to park there only for these, but what is the what is the mechanism for enforcing that? That's a big question. So um, this is interesting. There are a couple other cities in City Charging Ahead that are working on um, kind of ordinances around um, electric uh, charging. Let's, let's yeah, have that, have that discussion. Come to this event on March 28th called Evolution. At Como Park. At Como Park. At Como Park. <laughs> so the, uh, uh, there are two spaces that I'm familiar with that 100% uh, of the time have non-EVs in them. And one of them is at Como Park because parking is tight. And so someone will always park their car uh, by the conservatory, uh, their, their gas-powered car in that, uh, in that EV spot, which really is difficult. If, if, if you're telling people to come into St. Paul or into your city uh, because you can charge up, you don't need to have the range anxiety. You charge up and get home again. And you look online and you see the space is open and you get there and it's really uh, occupied by a, a gas powered car. Uh, that's an issue. So that's what I got. Great. Thank you. Uh, I do have a okay. question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, is the intent of the community, our car hubs, to give easy access? 
for people to drive outside the project area or mostly to drive between hubs. Example, driving downtown St. Paul to Woodbury. I, well, I don't think it's intended to get you out to Woodbury, but you can, I mean, you could go out to Woodbury and bring it back. If you had a doctor's appointment, for right. example. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. But it needs to come back into the geographic area, into the one of the pit charging posts. It does. Uh, but let, let me seize on that to say, as soon as this was announced, we had interest from some folks in Washington County, like, wouldn't it be great to have these installed along the gold line, for example? Uh, and uh, we're, as I said, interested in scaling up. So it might not just be to come back. We, sure. we may extend it. Okay. Thank you. And, and again, this is not my area of expertise, but I hear uh, the phrase first and last mile. And it's uh, the idea of um, if you want people to use transit, uh, how do you get them to to transit? How can you make? How can you simplify that process if they live, let's say, a, a mile away? And so some of these other options, the bikes, the scooters, and so forth, uh, close that gap or eliminate that gap to make uh, other existing modes of transit uh, more appealing and, and better used. I have another question uh, regarding the dockless bikes slash scooters, are there plans for some kind of regulations on where they can be left? I remember reading something last summer that other large cities were having issues with people leaving them in the middle of sidewalks and preventing wheelchair accessibility, et cetera. So I'm curious how St. Paul plans to manage that as the program expands. Yeah, so those regulations already exist. Uh, it's the enforcement of those regulations that we need to do a better job of in 2019. Um, so I, one of the things I mentioned before is uh, how does the city cover its costs related to these shared mobility options? And there are costs involved. There's managing contracts. There's uh, managing um, uh, reports of misuse of a, of a bike or a scooter or uh, uh, misplacement of it afterward. So those exist, of the requirements. Uh, we need to do a better job at ensuring that they um, that they're followed. This, this is also an issue of equity and uh, people's ability to get around. If you're, um, if you're walking or you are in a wheelchair and there's a scooter or a bike in the middle of the sidewalk, that becomes a real issue. Kind of like snow, which will be gone in July. <laughs> <laughs> Promise? You heard it here, people. I would think there's an educational component to all of this as well. No. Never thought about what it means when you leave a scooter in the middle of the sidewalk and maybe not be malicious, but that right. like these are new to our environment and learning how to use them correctly. There's going to be a learning curve. I would say. I think so. There's also a safety uh, issue. People should be wearing helmets. Uh, I've seen maybe one person wear a helmet. I, yeah, I have two questions on uh, the 20% parking in new development. Statute. Was there a discussion to actually have EV charging installed in that new development, or is it just going to be the conduit run to where the EV charging the parking stations are supposed to go in the future? Excellent question. Uh, our uh, goal is to balance, with, with regard to the overall policy, our goal is to balance moving developers and uh, the construction industry forward beyond what code requires, um, and, but not going so far that it becomes onerous uh, and creates a disincentive to have development or create development in St. Paul. Uh, so the purpose of this is to simply make an EV ready by putting in the conduit and allowing room in the electrical room for the EV charger box. Um, rather than requiring them to install it. And our expectation, uh, in, install the EV charger. Uh, our expectation is as there is a bigger uptake of EV owners uh, throughout the state uh, that those building owners will want to in uh, install the EV chargers at a later date. So we don't require the installation of the EV chargers now, just the 
make it easy ready. Long answer to a short question. My, my second question, you kind of touched on the answer already. Is there a plan to have these EV ready stations required to have EV chargers in the future? Uh, we have not uh, discussed that, but you know how things work. It's incremental and should we uh, deem at a future date that uh, that's something we want to do, we can certainly do that. Our, our hope is that the market will, once we say it's already EV ready, our hope is that the market will push building owners to do that because their tenants require it or demand it. So, sorry, it just occurs to me that obviously Uber and Lyft are, uh, you know, they have all Twin Cities. The thinking is that we need more options, we need shared mobility options beyond those um, taxi like services. So the question was about Uber, Lyft, they're here, they're taxi like services, but we need more than that in the Twin Cities. Yes. I, I, I don't. I, I don't know. I mean, that's that. I, I work on electric vehicles, but I mean, I think that that all of this, the shared mobility stuff, you know, is talking about we need more options. We just need more options. Um, you know, things are changing, and um, the way people get around is changing, and millennials are changing things because they don't, as a group, tend to not want to own a vehicle, which is awesome um, for our planet. Um, and then um, provides a you know question about how do we do that? How do we you know get people around? Um, we have you know our, our public bus system, but we need more. And ultimately, they may not all survive, right? Sure. Because, yeah, all these programs and all these uh, efforts might not all survive. I think it's you know it's definitely you know um, putting these uh, things out there and being kind of put sticks to the wall, if, if you will. I mean, I think that you know. That, I thought it was really, really interesting when you were talking about the birds and how like they, they force that conversation. Like you just drop into a city, turns out the city gets gets you get their attention, right? And happens. This so. corner was like very much part of Ground Zero for that. Was event. it? So we were we were watching it unfold. Was it? Were you yeah. like, wow, look at that? <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. So this has been awesome, um, and um, we have one um, last speaker, and then we'll have a, a few more minutes after that for question and answer. We've done a lot of that uh, throughout. I'm sorry if I haven't been repeating each of the questions I've been trying to, but um, uh, we will start with my friend, uh, Tara Brown, from the city of Edina, um, who could talk about both of the topics today. That's why she's yeah. the perfect speaker, and I love that you're wearing your Sorrel. I should have worn my Sorrel, too. But mine are orange, but it clashed a little bit. Yours yeah, like hat on. Yeah, I know. Where's your hat? <laughs> she's a little dog and pony show. Tara. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mm. Is it the arrow? Oh, I'm sorry. Going back? She needs to do something on her laptop. Is it back? Okay, try it in a second. There we go. There we go. Okay. So, some of you may know Adina, but just kind of some of the stats around it. It's a first ring suburb. There's only 50,000 people in the city. Most of them commute out of the city during the day. And then we have a large commute population into the city during the day. We have a lot of office buildings, a lot of medical buildings, a lot of retail and restaurants. So um, when we look at shared mobility, because it's that first and last mile, we were really excited about micro mobility because that allows some of the workers that come in more flexibility because we have a lot of restaurants, retail, they're looking for that um, transportation, not that single occupancy vehicle. We also have Highway 100, I'm sure some of you can grimace, or 62 to commute, that divides my city. And so there's a lot of single occupancy that we get around. So shared mobility wise, we have Uber or Lyft. We've never had policies or ordinances restricting the kind of on-demand car sharing service. This last year we did have a memorandum of understanding and MOU with line bikes for bikes and scooters. Full disclosure, they would say this. The only reason they were in our city is because we were next to one of the big cities. Right? So we the population count for us wasn't there, um, but they really were solace as a testing ground for the others. Pardon me, I have to look at my notes. So the bikes went out first. 
and then the e-bikes came later. And just as a note, we have not invested any money into line bike service. This is all a pilot and a memorandum of understanding, so the city's never invested money in this, only time to create the memorandum of understanding. And then we have a great communication system with our residents um, through newsletters and this quarterly magazine. So we were able to ensure to get the word out there and build credibility with the service. That's what we did. So just a little by the numbers. Um, bikes went out first. And those were, and then electric bikes and then scooters. But you can even see scooters went out on um, how many were there and how many trips were done. So this is the little data that we did get. I'd love to give you some demographic data, some math data of where they were, but that hasn't been available. We've been asking for that before we go into our memorandum of understanding for this year. It wasn't supplied. What we do know from the U of M at a high level is that um, female to male, more males ride the scooters, and it's the same like percentage across ethnicity whereas women, it's a little lower. So we're talking and looking at a couple ways how we can do some kind of test out events. Um, there is a country club. I know you might have grown at country club, but we don't have rec centers in our city. So there's no rec centers. So there's a lot of families that actually go to a country club that pride themselves in calling out a country club. At any rate, 80% of the people that go to this country club live within two miles of the country club. And their biggest issue is parking. And I said, we haven't done it yet, but we're like, let's do a little ride and drive test to figure out how we can get more people on the bikes and scooters because you're not just golfing there, you're having your family events there, your pool, your tennis, other things. Um, and then also you can see it's the last mile, first mile, both for bikes and scooters. They're only taking this a mile. And the median trip time a little faster on those scooters. Uh, some other stats I do have around, uh, there was no major injury reported for 3,000 trips. Um, and then vandalism was only 5% of repair efforts. So very low vandalism. We only had 49 complaints out of 3,000 trips. Um, and a third of those were unfounded complaints, like they were in the right of way and they're like, ah, someone has something here. That's not, that's where it's supposed to be. But a third were complaints where, hey, it was left on the pro private property side instead of the right of way. Um, again, maybe in the middle of a sidewalk where someone else couldn't access that sidewalk. And a third of the complaints were about, you know, being broken or not finding the scooter or wanting the scooter. So that's kind of our finding. I went through that really fast. I'm sorry. Should I pause? Any <laughs> questions around that? No. Perfect. So, um, as we're going into 2019 and deciding in July when things come out again, um, when there's no snow, right? When there's no snow, we've determined that we're going to stick with line bike and we're not going to have any other. Um, organization come in, if those start coming in, if the birds just start landing, then we might have to talk about policies. But right now we don't have any policy ordinances or licensing around this. We're going to continue to test it. And um, given that the organization is there because we're close to another urban area, I do live in Minneapolis, so I saw that the neighborhoods kind of by Edina, you would start to see some of these line bikes coming in, which is great because again, if you look, um, cars on the street. But um, this is how we're going to test going forward. I do know there were some questions around um, how do you kind of fence this stuff in. There has been discussion of geofencing. Um, and it's hard because the geofencing isn't that accurate. So there's discussion of do you geofence within a city. I think there's a lot of people that say no, people go between cities. We have the perfect example. Everyone's leaving during the day. We have a whole bunch of other people coming in during the day. Um, and unfortunately, with the geofencing not being accurate enough yet, what would be nice to geofence is where you park, like maybe kind of offering discounts or whatever if you park in a certain area versus just in, versus three scooters in front of someone's house. Right. Um, I just 
I just <laughs> <laughs> or not. Um, so UV charging. Uh, in the beginning of 2018, this is what UV charging looks like if you go on PlugShare uh, in the city. And we we have basically four quadrants. You can see 162 split our city. And everything was in the southeast quadrant. That's where a lot of our density is. Um, this is almost all single family homes. This is more dense. We do have some condo areas in here, but a lot of the rest of this is single family homes. Um, and so when we looked at this, and all of this was privately owned. One Byerly, any new one Byerly store, they install an EV station. That's one of those Metro Transit has one at Southdale Mall because that's a regional area. We have buses coming in, which is great. Um, there's some at the Galleria, again, more shopping. They're offering this with retail. And then we had a couple at apartments, at mixed use land development. So apartments and some yoga restaurants on the first floor. That's where we're seeing. We, again, know the hurdle of people feeling like they, they're close to a plug. I only have 30 miles in my gas tank, in my BEV gas tank right now, so I'm kind of watching that. Um, so we've de decided in 2018 that every, for five years, we'd look at installing um, EV charging five locations over five years in the city to kind of help out with that. And so, <coughs> When deciding that, we first looked at location, and then we also looked at what's being constructed because it's more, it's cheaper to put something in when you're constructing than when you're blowing something up. So this last year, we were adding a second level to the parking that we own at 50th and France. 50th and France is kind of our downtown area even though a lot of the density is in Southdale. That's our little cute downtown retail area. And with that, we installed an e two EV chargers there with conduits for two more. So one, one charger, two plugs, conduits for one more. Big learning we had, you can put it into the design requirement, but if you don't have a designer with experience, it's not going to be executed well. I didn't have a picture of this, but Picture having one, I have an installation here. I have an EV charger um, parking space here. And then this is a corner. Around the corner is the other EV parking. Ooh. Because of fire, um, needs for in the middle of fires, right? People being able to step over certain cords. They couldn't step over two cords and get to the 10 seconds to the stairwell. So it was moved. And somehow they thought it'd be good to then put the conduit for the next two across. And then this is where the drive is. And you know how you go around the U of a parking lot? Well, we're going to just put it in the middle and then on two opposite sides is where the others are going to be. Right, so again, you can put it in the requirements, but maybe your requirement should be to have someone that's done the installation. So that was one of our biggest points. Another big learning that we have is it's being used. We're really excited about this. Our location works. What we did is we set up, this is just the last 90 days, and it's every day, so or every week. So basically, in the last 90 days, it's been used 175 times. In the last how long? 90 days? Yep. We it had a soft launch in mid-November. It's been used 175 cents wow. in the last 90 days. Um, what's really great is we did put some parking restrictions on this. So there's two signs. Uh, one says parking for customer two hours or less. We're finding 70% of the usage, 70% of this 175 are two hours or less. There's a lot of 20 minutes and there's a lot of hour and 15 which balances out to about an hour and a half. So 30%, so almost one in three usages right now is going over that two, two hour time. So all the three, three hours, we've had a couple of other outliers. But overall, we're happy with this. We did choose uh, 
charge point because we have the ability. We haven't turned it on yet. It would take, so you might want to think about this as a city owning in public. What kind of restrictions and approval do you need from council to be a little bit more nimble um, in the future? Because for us to turn on a charging fee, we're going to need to go to council about this. And, there are, and there's still construction going on in this area. And while it's a developer and it's nothing that we own, right, residents and businesses still see it as the city's issue. So um, we're not really interested in putting a chart. While we see a need to maybe put a charge on, pack a charge on after two hours, like two hours and 15 minutes, to discourage that one in three that's using over it and make sure we have this parking spot available for other shoppers. We're not doing that yet because of the political reasons and needs and things that are still going on there to go back to council. But if we would have had that flexibility in the beginning, that might have been a different story. So just that's another learning that we had. Um, and I think what we found is that basically 175 sessions and we have a lot of unique drivers. So of this, um, each driver is coming 1.7 times. There are a couple of super users. There are a lot of unique drivers, but it averages out to 1.7 times. So that's really good because our intention was to put it in a location where people come from different areas, um, have meetings. There are There's retail, there's restaurant. There's also dentist shops here. There are a couple other service. Um, businesses here. So we're really happy with this. And I think when we look at our map, we haven't determined where everything else is going publicly. I'll talk about how we're thinking private. But um, here's our city hall. And so our next one is going to be city hall. We're doing a space need study. And we're also combining it with what we need with our fleet before we do that installation. And then, of course, looking here um, is our hockey arena. Hockey is keen in Edina. We have a lot of people coming from outside of the city, so we're thinking that's another great spot because also with MPCA supercharging maps, um, a big part that's missed is this part of the metro area because we're close enough to downtown where everything's put downtown or further away. And inner city, these first three suburbs are kind of missed because there's still places where people go. So we think that this section here. Um, still needs a lot of EV chargers because we're hitting St. Louis Park, we're hitting Eden Prairie, we're hitting Bloomington and us. And so we see this as maybe a great place to hit it because we have baseball fields that are used regionally, we have the tree rinks that's used regionally, and then we also have um, a great park and golf course that people can utilize that as well. So that's probably going to be our third location, but we're still going to go out for community engagement and go to places where people are already at. So open streets, we have a lot of people at. If we're looking at this area, we're going to talk to people down here and see if that's really the place they want to go. Um, so that's what we're looking at publicly. Privately, how we're incentivizing. We don't have a green building policy yet, uh, but we do write conditions on build developers that come in for PUD rezoning. And those we can do a gift for a gift. A year ago, I started this. And then I had data that showed, hey, we have 3% EV penetration in our city. You need to put down at least 3% EV chargers now with conduits for 5 to 10%. That was a year ago. And 10% for families, because again, when is cheap at night, we want people charging where they live at night. And then 5% in more of those offices or more multi-use buildings. Um, we're just now seeing those buildings come to 90% design review, 60% design review. Even three or four months ago, one of the owners was kind of like, ah, oh, I have this in Rochester. No one uses it. Do I really have to do this? Yeah. Now, four months later, the other owner is coming in. He's like, oh, yeah, you guys didn't even ask for enough. And so even a year ago when I was asking for this much, some of those owners, this is an apartment complex that is luxury apartments because that's what's mostly being built. Um, so he gets it. Um, but it's even funny how much more my simple ask is what they're planning to do now if you look into it. So it's still great to put on conditions, 
because it forces them to look at it. And once they look at that topic, they realize how much they need to lay conduit now. Did your PUD, does your PUD ordinance have this as one, one of a list of uh, amenities? Yeah, the question was, is this one of the list of amenities? So I do create a sustainability memo for PUD rezoning now since I don't have a green building policy. I'm happy to share that with anyone that emails me. It. Um, the challenge is with that is I'm managing a lot of one-offs and I'm having to go to these construction design reviews before permitting. So it, it takes a lot to manage. I'd rather have a green building policy and just apply that. But um, that's what we have right now and we're work, going to be working towards the green building policy later. So that's one of my conditions. One of the other conditions, again, I try to help them um, ensure that they're not um, inhibiting their business of the future. So, for example, if they have trash chutes, I'm requiring that they have a third chute for organics in the future. I'm not saying you have to offer organics as a service. That's your business decision. But you need to make way for it. An electrical room, 20% more room, because they like to make those rooms tight, right? You need to have 20% more room in case you want to do um, solar the next time you have to redo your roof. So those are some of the things that we're asking in our PUD rezoning. That's what we're doing right now to incentivize um, private ownership. We're not, or maybe well, between incentivizing and requiring, but um, we're looking at an EV strategy this year. I wish I had more for you on that. Our transportation plan, we're fortunate, we're a small city, but we have a transportation planner. And most of that person's role is bike and sidewalks as we're increasing those. But we've been starting to talk about EV. He left for another great opportunity in January and we're just getting our new person up just yet. So we'll probably be looking at that in um, July and I'll have more information in July is how we execute that. Um, Question? Yeah. Let's see. Okay. Is there a way to tell with the scooters, bikes, what percentage of rides are commute type rides versus recreational joy? We don't have that information now. And we didn't have it um, demographically or on a map. But one thing we were hoping is because this is more in the 50th and France area, and that is one of the places where we have a lot of people coming in for work that don't live in Minneapolis or in Edina. Um, that we do see hopefully more commute than just recreation. And we do have bus routes in the Dyna Metro Transit bus route, so there are commuters we can yeah. I can speak to that a little bit anecdotally. Um, uh, my girlfriend lives in Los Angeles where, um, and works at UCLA where Bird and Lime were both like piloted. And um, from my experience, I visit her a couple times uh, every couple months. Um, so I have used these scooters a lot. And in my experience, um, and even like in Minneapolis here this summer, uh, people mostly use them for commuting, um, especially in that like last mile. I think the first time people use them, uh, like their friends will say, hey, you should try these out, they're really fun, and they might take them someplace. Mm -hmm. But then after that, it's almost, I'd say like, at least in my experience, like 80 to 90 percent um, like transportation, because uh, you do it a couple times and then you're just kind of over it. Fun, yeah, right. they, they are fun, but. Yeah. Yeah. We're good. I, yeah. I think for smaller cities, it could be really fun. When I think of a smaller city that has a conference center that people come into town, like, again, maybe not the city investing it, but how can you have that conference center maybe buy a few and test it out or ask for it since that app is already available and setting it up? Like, I think there's a lot of ways that you could support micro mobility by partnering with the businesses there rather than taking it on yourself as well. This might be more of a question for Kurt, but um, when I was in Washington, D.C. last fall, they have like five different brands of scooters and bikes out there for some reason. But what really interested me is they actually blocked off. You can't park any of them around um, the mall. And so, like you actually would get fined or I don't know what exactly would happen, but when you were going to park it, it would not let you shut off, shut it off within a specific zone. 
Um, so, you know, in, in areas like our capital complex or, you know, busy downtown areas where you, know, you don't want people to be parking them right on the sidewalk, have those, uh, has that been considered at all in either of the cities? So that was that geofencing. I was, the question was, um, in BC, they, there are certain areas where you just can't shut off the um, bike or the scooter because they don't want you parking around the mall. Um, yeah, that would be geofencing. And I know um, my transportation planner and director has been in conversations about micro mobility in the region um, with some of the other cities. And they said, they're looking at geofencing, but it's not as accurate as they'd like, so they haven't executed it. Do either of you have anything to add to that? Yeah. I can add a little. So um, the accuracy of the geofencing depends a lot on nearby buildings. So if you're in an open area, it's very accurate. And then when you get into sort of downtown canyons, that's when it becomes problematic. It's also one of the places where you care most because that's where the tightest area is. So uh, it's a little bit of a challenge, but it's, uh, it's neither um, uh, hopeless because it really does work very, very well uh, in some places. And anyone with a cell phone can tell it actually works pretty well. Like it will show you exactly where you are most of the time, um, but not always. Any other questions? Great. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Wow, it's 11. <laughs> we didn't think we would have enough stuff, but I feel it. So. Um, Thank you, everyone. I um, want we'll just say thank you to all of our speakers. Can we give all of our speakers a round of applause? Today, today? Oh my God, something. No, Will didn't learn anything. It's a joke. <laughs> um, so, and I also, again, thank you to Siemens, our workshop series sponsor. Um, it's very difficult to do this without money, it turns out. Um, so, thank you so much for your sponsorship. A couple of announcements. Um, uh, for those that don't know, I don't need this. Oh, there's one more slide. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'll get that to that in one second. Um, there is, um, for those who don't know, the Minnesota Department of Commerce has an RFP out there um, for initiatives that promote clean energy education at the community level for the state fair. Um, there is more information on the Green City City's website, I believe, yeah. about this. Uh, up to $2,500 is due at the end of March, like the 27th. Um, it's that time of the year again. Um, the League of Minnesota Cities um, does um, at their annual event um, a Sustainable City Award uh, with Green Set Cities. And so it's three years old now, four years, somewhere in that yeah, range. But, far, yeah. you know, you have to be a Green Set City to get the award. And there's lots of worthy ones, and it's some cash. So think about that. And um, applications are postmarked by May 6th, so you have some time, but don't wait too long. Um, also, it's also that time of year where um, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is looking for host sites for Minnesota Green Corps members. Cities are amazing places for Green Corps members to be um, uh, working. And so think about this. And um, I, I believe also some cities have shared the Green Corps member or shared in an area or no? Yes, it's a, it's a tricky, tricky application. So never mind <laughs> that. Better rewind. 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 So Green Corps host site cities, please apply individually. Um, and then um, our next workshop, uh, April 3rd, is uh, the Smart City Energy and Dollar Saved by Smart Data Usage, the future. Smart. And then Laura. I'm also shamefully plugging this on her behalf as well. So yeah, that should be um, kind of fun. And we've got a really cool Smart City example uh, that we can highlight. And I know Abby is working on um, Abby Finnis, my colleague at Abby Finnis. So uh, that was Laura from Siemens just talking about this. There's going to be some really great stuff there. So, you know, make sure to sign up. Join us in the room for bagels and coffee or on the webinar if that works better for you. Hopefully there won't be snow <laughs> that day. <laughs> I'm a liar. There will be snow. Um, so thank you, everyone. Any, any last things? Did I forget anything? Team.
Uh, big thanks to Danielle from League of Minnesota Cities for running the webinar and doing all the things. Yeah. Yay. Uh, it will be recorded and online as always, so you can share with your friends. Um, uh, thank you to all of our speakers and to Chris, uh, my colleague, who helped put together a lot of this. This is not